Heidi Neal um, earned a BS degree in family science with an emphasis in child development and a minor in music from BYU Provo in 1999. She has been teaching piano for 13 years and started her own music teaching blog, Heidi's Piano Notes.blogspot.com. She'll want to write down, and I'm sure she'll tell that to you again. Um, and she did that while teaching piano preschool eight years ago. She loves to organize and share her ideas about music teaching there on that blog. She was excited to move here to Rex Rexburg last year um, with her husband, Jared. And Jared's in the back helping out. Welcome, Jared. We're happy to have you. And they have six children, ages 5 to 17. And in addition to piano teaching, she is passionate about education and family history. Everyone give a warm round of applause and welcome to Heidi Neal. Thank you. Um, I am excited to be here today. I, I'm in charge of the refreshments as well, so there's some water over there if you didn't grab it. If you want to get up and go grab one, that's any time, you can feel free to do that. And I have a kidney stone, so I'll be drinking those. Oh, <laughs> um, so I just wanted to start out with an experience. When I was, um, I, I try to help out in my kids' kindergarten classes. And so one time when I went to go help in my son's class, I got there a little early and the teacher was still engaged in teaching. Um, and she was doing a spotlight for the kids. And instead of just doing like, this is Jimmy and he loves pizza and he has three kids in his family. She did this totally engaging activity that maximized her uh, teaching to teach them a lot of different concepts. They were all engaged. There weren't any um, behavior problems and I was just so inspired by it. So she, she had a whiteboard and she started to sing a song about a circle as she drew a circle and as she was doing that the kids were drawing a circle in the air and then she drew a square with a different color to represent the color of the person who's wearing that color of shirt and they're spotlighting and sang a song about a square and then if it was a girl she drew a triangle and, and sang a song about that and I was just amazed how she was able to engage them in so many different ways she was engaging them by having them move, by having them sing, and by having them watch something at the same time as she was teaching principles of color and shape and counting. Um, and there was also the element of surprise where they're looking around to try to figure out, like, who is this person that she's talking about? Um, and I thought, I want to be that type of teacher. I want to be the type of teacher that, you know, we have such a limited amount of time during our music lessons that we really need to pack in the learning because they're not with us for you know every single day like a school teacher. Um, but I just loved how she maximized that time to teach them all kinds of different things and really to reach different types of students and learning styles. Um, and so I, the the whole time I'll be referring to things that are also on my blog. So I put like a instead of giving you a a handout. I have a post on my blog, so if you have your devices and you want to refer to it now, you can. Or if you want to go back and look at it later, it has some images um, of some of the things I'll be referring to. And it's Heidi's Piano Notes. Right, that one here. Dot blogspot. Dot com. And so as I was preparing, I, I ran across this quote that really made me think of this experience. It says, it's by Wilson Arthur Ward. It says, the mediocre teacher tells, the good teacher explains, the superior teacher demonstrates, and the great teacher inspires. And I thought, you know, I, I know there's times when I have been that, just the good teacher that explains, and I'm, you know, this is a sharp, and it means you move a half step higher, and you just look at something. But how much more effective it is if we demonstrate, we involve something that they can hear and that they can experience to make it so that those principles are really sticking. Um, I mentioned how sh this teacher um, involved the element of surprise. So I think I kind of surprised some of you as I handed out the headbands today. Um, and the other surprise is we're going to be playing some games throughout and we're going to have a competition between this side and this side. So I want you to listen 
and see if you can hear, maybe if you don't have teenagers, you might not know this song, but I'm going to play a song and that's going to be the name of our team over here, and then I'll play another one and that's the name of the team over here. <laughs> Maybe that's how Old Man Tucker starts too, but it's it's all about the bass, about the bass, no treble. It's all about the bass, about the bass. So we'll we'll have this side over here, the left side of the room, be our um, bass clef. Does that, does, did everyone have a chance to write this down? I'm gonna take that off. And then my husband is gonna be the scorekeeper. So we have the bass clef over here, and there's a really fun. Um, YouTube video that a music teacher put together that has like images of that that's talking about the bass and they change the words up a little bit that you could show to your students if you want to teach them about the bass class. And then um, I don't know if I have this exactly right, but this is a uh, that's a, that, not that wrong enough. That note at the end sounded like it might be wrong. Does anyone know that song? Trouble. Yeah. Trouble. Yeah. Trouble. Taylor Swift. Yeah, it's like. I, oh, I can't sing that. I'm not a vocalist, I'm a pianist. I knew that, that you were treble when you walked in. There's also a YouTube video about that, and then it goes through and talks about the lines of the treble staff, and your middle line, your second line is G. Anyway, so we're gonna have the right side be the treble. So I'll hand this to Jared, and he can keep score as we do some different activities. Um, so I wanted to start out with uh, talking about technique. And I know, how many of you here do not teach piano? Just one, okay. <laughs> I tried to make the things so that they could apply to music teachers of all instruments. Um, but I teach piano and I also play the violin. So there's some things that may not specifically apply to just strings, but you can think how you could adapt this um, to the instrument that you teach. So, um, I came up with an activity, it's called the Caterpillar Crawl. I was, I was, um, I wanted something that could introduce all the different piano motions that you use uh, with young children. And so I, I uh, play Mozart Rondo a la Turca, which if you're, if you think, just that gets that in your mind. Um, and then I have the students Pretend, so I tell this story, there's a caterpillar and he's going to the gym to do his workout. And first he gets on his bicycle, and so he does wrist circles. Caterpillar crawl, caterpillar crawl, pedal around and do not fall. Well, that's, I'm, I shouldn't be seeing this, but I am. Um, and then he goes to uh, jump, do the jump rope. Then we'll jump around and have some fun, just like a bouncing ball. Um, and then it gets to the part, float off gently, glide back down, float off gently, glide back down. Um, and then, so it, it follows the form of the music, some of the parts repeat. So they're learning how to listen to form. They're moving their hands um, to learn the basic, you know, the wrist circles that you'll need, um, float offs at the end of phrases. Um, they're feeling the beat with rhythm, with like when you're doing the jump ropes, but then also thinking of that bouncy hand motion that you need, need when you're doing staccatos. Um, um, and as it, then as it goes further into the song, then they do da 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 So they're making O's to practice having those strong um, fingertips. And then, um, it's easier to maybe do it on my arm here. So for the sneaky thumb tucks for your scale, you know how it's sometimes tricky for kids to learn how to tuck their thumbs under when they're doing the scale, and they go like this. You know, think of the fast moving passage, and they're just moving their hand back and forth, practicing, tucking their thumb underneath. Um, and then at the very end, they have the um, rocking hand motion. So I have on my blog a poster, this is what I call a music map, that has images that they can watch to follow along to see what's coming next. Um, and I usually will just introduce like the first part, the first half of it at the beginning um, to them and then gradually, I do this in private lessons and also in group lessons. Um, 
and then they're just learning those basic motions before they actually maybe are having to encounter them in the piano. So way before I start having them do the one octave scales, they're learning how to do that thumb tuck and really getting good at doing that. And I, I chose, I, I don't know, I came up with this, but really inspired by that teacher where I thought I, I'm multitasking to the max. Like you're doing all of these different things at once. You're practicing rhythm, you're practicing technique, you're listening to form. Um, and because it's a story, it makes it a little bit easier to remember, so it's helping with the memory of that. Um, so that's just, that's one of the technique um, activities that I use in my studio. Um, I also, I think that stories are so effective with children, and really with adults. You think of, if you hear a story, instead of just like a dry lecture, you're much more likely to remember because it has a natural sequence of events. So when I teach kids about how they're supposed to have their hand position, um, there was a, the once a crocodile named Niall, and he was scared of heights. And so he didn't want to climb a tall mountain like this. And he didn't want to go down, because then he'd have to climb up higher. He liked walking on level ground. So he walks along the level, right, the level ground, and then he has a secret entrance into his home. It's a, it's a thumb slide. So he slides down the thumb, and he crawls into his house. And once he's in there, he feels nice and safe. But if the rain starts to come, or the wind starts to blow, he doesn't want the roof of his house to fall off like this and have his fingers flying. They need to stay down to protect him. And so I introduced that story and you know talk about those different elements of proper hand <coughs> position. Um, but then when I notice them, maybe not doing one of the things that they're supposed to, it's easier and maybe less um, I can't think of the like it's it doesn't they don't feel as defensive when you just say oh Niall's scared of heights when you start noticing their wrist up here or like oh no the rain's coming in if you just have that little analogy it's, it's they take it a little easier than if you're like you know what you need to relax your pinky again even though I've already told you that before so um, I like to use that to help them with proper hand position another one of my favorite technique. Um, tools is Piano Safari. And how many of you guys have used Piano Safari or heard of it before? Oh, well you're missing out. I've heard of it, yes. I've used it. So this is, I, I use the, um, <coughs> there's some rope technique pieces. So just like in Suzuki, I have a daughter who's playing cello. And in Suzuki method, um, they really want them to focus on proper technique and tone without having the com complexities of the staff and the notes at first. Um, and so her teacher will tell stories and add song, words to go with the songs as, she, as they teach um, the songs. And in Piano Safari, they have rope pieces that are teaching the basic hand positions. If you go to pianosafari.com, you can see a video that explains every single um, motion that they have, that they talk about having arm weight. Um, one of my favorite... I just had a group lesson yesterday, and in my group lessons I have all the students uh, perform for each other, and so I had this um, student who was my, she's, she's about the same age as the other students, but she just barely started taking. And so, you know, it's hard to adapt a group lesson to get the ages of, to, to reach the ages of all of the kids, and I, so I have to help her a little bit with some of the games that we're doing, because she's not quite on, she just barely started the, the staff. But I, when she performed her song, my student who's been, who is a Let's Play Music graduate, that we have Justine back here, who's a Let's, I love Let's Play Music. It's a, it's one of those programs that I think does use these elements that I'm talking about, where they have, they're really engaged, they're hearing, they're doing all, several things at once without maybe even knowing it. Anyway, he's a, he's a Let's Play Music graduate, and he just picks up on things really fast and he's really good. Well, I, she, she played her road piece, which is, um, it's called I Love Coffee, which most of us, my students and I don't love coffee, so we call it the Half Step Song. Um, and I made a little um, music map for the song for the, to introduce how it, how it goes. And so I have them first do um, the ping pong. You probably have heard this before. Okay. 
hanger. So I tell a story about how it's like someone, they, they want to go on the perfect date. So they first go and they play ping pong, and then they roll on the grassy hill, and then they want to go, they want to jump off of a cliff into the water. And I'm just doing like a brief part, part, of it, part of it, but you probably have heard this song before. And then, um, <coughs> bug slug. Um, I use the words, bug slug is a let's play music. Uh, concept where they use the names of bugs to introduce the rhythms. So there's a bug is a quarter note, a slug is a half note, a caterpillar is a, is four sixteenth notes. Um, and since I teach a lot of connection students, they're familiar with that. And so having that bug slug uh, um, is something that they are already familiar with. So you go to the park, you discover some bugs, and then you get on the teeter totter. <laughs> Skate crash, it's like teeter totter, but you play them at the same time. But um, I, at the end, after she played this song, there's those six piece parts, and I just played little bits of them for you. My student who's been playing the longest was like, Can you send that to my mom so I can learn how to play? And I thought it was so neat because here's a student who's the one who probably, I mean, she has. She's the one that just barely started, even though she's the same age, and so she might feel inferior if she's playing, you know, a C, D, E, E, D, C, but it's building her confidence. She's engaged because she's doing something um, that really sounds cool. And kids are able to do technical things that are a little bit harder than what they can do note reading, because it takes a while to, to build that foundation of note reading. And so I do rope pieces in addition to the, the standard um, note reading activities. Um, and then I have, check the time here, I have um, just a few other tools that I use. I, when I'm introducing uh, wrist rotation, I'll just stick this monkey, clip the monkey onto the wrist, and, we'll, and then have it, have it sway. So when you're going like this, it's like, can you feel that it's swaying back and forth? Um, for the first month of lessons, I have these, this is a balloon that's filled with Play-Doh. It kind of feels like a stress ball. Um, and it takes them a while to get used to that feeling of keeping their fingers curved and building the finger strength. And so you can have them do practice the fingering of their songs on their little Play-Doh stress ball. Or even if they're just, you know, bored somewhere and they have their thing with them, they're just practicing that feeling of dipping down into the keys with a curved finger. Uh, this piano finger trampoline, I got the idea from Teach Piano Today, which is a blog, um, although they call it something different, where you can kind of do the same thing where you're filling that dip down. This was just a Play-Doh container that I got the Play-Doh out of here from the dollar store, and then you just cut off the neck of a balloon and wrap it around it. And so you can do the dipping like a trampoline, or you can do, with rhythm activities, you can use it as a plug, you know, where you, they're echoing what you do for rhythm. Um, and they'll just like the fun sound of that. Um, I did a thumb tuck challenge with one of my students where I had him have the closed fall board and then see if he could go all the way across like this to practice not doing that. When you do your scales, you don't want to have that. When you move your thumb under, you don't want to have that where it, it like uh, has a strong note. You want it to be to have even tone, and so I was just practicing keeping your wrist level as you just quickly go across and then come back down. Um, and then depending on you know, I really adapt to the student. If if there's a kid that's not going to really appreciate a crocodile in the Nile as their analogy, I'll use a princess in a castle. Or a little, some of the younger kids really like having a little fuzzy in a fuzzy house. So I just have this little fuzzy that they get put underneath their hand. Um, and that's, that's all on that I have for technique. I will share, this is, if you ever have, have you ever had students who are like talking when you're trying to, or trying to play on the keys when you're trying to give them instructions? Um, <laughs> This is a game from Pianimation.com that really helps with, especially with kids that have attention 
issues. Um, I'll read at the beginning of the lesson what the requirements are, and then at the end they pick a card, and so it's like you have a chance to win one of these, um, whatever, it could be like a little smarty or, some, or a little pencil or a prize at the end of your lesson. If when you pick your chance card, if it's something that you did, and so it's like, did I have a positive attitude to today? Did I sit tall at the piano for my whole lesson? Did I use a good hand position for each song? And then I, the one that I love is that, did I keep my fingers from doodling on the keys when my teacher gave instructions? And so you can find that on pianimation.com. Um, it's part of her musicopoly incentive, but that's a great way to keep kids engaged and kind of deal with behavior issues in a subtle way that they don't mm -hmm. really get defensive about. Justine, did you have a question? Oh, I was just <clears throat> laughing this last week when you said the Nile crocodile might not work with all students or princess. I, I, this last week I was trying to teach a heart hand technique and I had the image of like the long beach waves and I have an older student who's in her 50s, totally didn't get it. <laughs> and then I told the college girl, she's like, oh yeah, that's exactly how it is. Yeah. So you just have to find, I think as a teacher, you really have to, it's our job to keep working and working until we find the analogy that works best for that student. Right, the thing that they can connect with, because we all have different experiences that we bring to right. lessons or to life. Thank you. Um, Oh, I thought I had covered all the technique. This is just, when I, when I have my students do their technique, like their scales, I assign them this three-step thing where they first analyze and try to learn the pattern. So if they're doing a pentascale, just remember what are the notes that you have there? And then try to uh, look at their hand and make sure that it's doing the right things, that they have, you know, their pinkies relaxed and that they're um, playing on their fingertips. Um, and then, the last thing I have them do is close their eyes or blindfold if necessary and have them listen to the tone of the scale that they're playing. So for a three step, I, I use the ALL acronym to help them remember that. Um, does anyone have any questions or, about technique or should we move on to rhythm? Yeah. <coughs> what kind of uh, results do you find with, with these stories and so on? Do they, I mean, do they quickly remember, like for example, that hand position thing, the, the element of the story that First. I think, I mean, with like the Nile, the crocodile, if I just say, oh, it's raining, yeah, they know they what exactly we're they, talking they, about. So they, they remember that. Yeah, yeah. Do you so, have to reinforce it a lot? Well, I mean, it depends. You have some students that just seem like they come with more of a, a natural ease to, for hand position. I have, I have a son that doesn't, but the analogy I use for him with hand position, he has he plays with such flat fingers, and he actually doesn't really play. He does wrestling and football now. He's just shifted his motivation <laughs> there. Um, but for him, I talked about wrestling and how your thumb is like the referee, and you know you don't want to go flat. But for wrestling, you don't want to be flat on the map. So this is the referee that's letting you know. And I had to bring that up a lot. It wasn't just an instant. Yeah, that's, that hand is Great. just perfect. But it but it, he he connects to that, and so. But, but the, the actual analogy, the reinforcement isn't, I mean, to like remember what the analogy is, is not difficult for them. No, I think that, I think because it's unique, you know, it's, it captures your attention more than if someone just said, Holy okay, God. don't play with flat fingers. When you have some type of, whether it's a bubble hand or a balloon that pulls your wrist off, whatever, when you use, when you relate something that, to something that they've already experienced or seen, or seen then it makes it more memorable for them. Thank you. Um, Okay, so let's move on to rhythm. And I, each of you have a handout. Hopefully there was enough of the rhythm cup explorations. I, I had contacted Wendy at composecreate.com um, and she gave us a sample of, she has these books that are focused on rhythm. There's, you can actually buy the backtracking so they have this fun backtrack in the background. And you do different things for the rhythm. So if you look at the paper, it shows how I didn't bring a cup, but you can just imagine my hand is the cup. So if it has a circle, you hit the table. If it has an X, you hit your hand. So let's try doing, the first one just has the circle, the circle, the X, and then the pass. So let's just try practicing that together. I'll count off and then you guys do number one together with me. So one, two, ready, go. And then you 
pass and then you pick up a cup. So you can do this as, as a group activity or even if you just did it in private lessons with your one student and it's you and them across the bench from each other kneeling on the floor passing the cup. Um, it's just a great way to isolate if they're struggling with rhythm to isolate that concept and do it in a fun way. And then um, if you look at the, the third one, this one's a little bit trickier because she adds in where um, it has a smiley face, so you tap a friend, and then there's a thing where you tap the cup on your forehead. And it's, she has a lot of videos that's kind of fun to watch and see how fast these students can do it. But let's just try uh, the third one really quick. One, two, ready, go. One. <laughs> so that's a little more complex. You wouldn't want to just start off your student with that, but if they're wanting the challenge, it really makes the rhythm internalized as they're doing these fun rhythms and doing the activities so that when they actually do it in their music, it's going to be easier for them. Um, I used that concept and I applied it to a song in, so they're in the Piano Adventures performance book, there's a song called Mr. McGill and it has a tricky rhythm. It's Mr. McGill lived high on a hill. And so it has that repeating rhythm, and so I, I kind of did the same thing where I emphasized the downbeats and the upbeats, and so they can have that sense of pulse, and it has that tied note where I have them slide. So you don't, you can apply it to the actual other pieces that they're using, just using that same concept of the rhythm cups. Um, let's do a quick rhythm dictation relay. So I am going to... I, I, uh, I made these uh, bed bug hotels where I use silly putty and have kids dictate the rhythm. Um, so I had a, a student that had learned Twinkle Twinkle Little Star and then they learned a rope piece Charlie Chipmunk in Piano Safari. They have the same rhythm and then I introduced her to what it looks like on the silly putty board where it's just, you know, twinkle, twinkle. Obviously, that's not what I have here. Um, so she could see and feel what the rhythm is like. And then I introduced her to the note names and actually what they look like and what they're called. So that teaching order of first introducing hearing and then feeling and seeing is sometimes more effective than if you just say, this is a quarter note and it looks like this and it means one. But if they don't have a underlying feeling of what that feels like, it's harder for them to remember. So we're going to, I also use these um, for rhythm dictation when I have groups. So I'm going to take off the silly putty and I'm going to get, I need a volunteer from the bass and a volunteer from the trebles to come up and I'm going to clap a rhythm and I have skittles and I'm going to put, um, two skittles on each bed, because each bed represents a beat. So if you have two skittles, that's like two eighth notes on a beat. And then I'll clap the rhythm, and then you have to race up here to grab the skittle that doesn't belong. <laughs> maybe, I, maybe that pack of skittles, that, that pack of skittles does not have an, enough skittles in it. So we'll have to change, well, We'll, add, we'll, we'll change some of them to uh, quarter notes. This one is the bonus one because it stuck together. So just imagine that's just one, even though it looks like two. So can I have a volunteer from this side who would like to come up and eat a Skittle? And someone <laughs> over here. <laughs> okay, so let's have you both, um, let's see, we don't want to hit the, I don't want to hit the video camera. That wouldn't be good. You need to pull it away from the from the tablecloth. Tablecloth. Mm -hmm. So let's have you just stand right in front of the video camera, and then someone on this side, on the treble side, that could volunteer. You just get a. Just okay. Sorry. So you're gonna. So I'm going to clap a rhythm, and then you have to listen and see which skittle do you need to take off. Which one is not a group of two eighth notes. And I mean, obviously, some of these, like, so this is, right now, it's quarter, quarter, two eighths, two eighths. Oh, you're going to so, have a four beat rhythm. 
I'm going to clap a four beat rhythm. Oh, this yeah. is his board, this is your board. And then when, uh, yeah, you hear the one that need, has, needs to have a beat taken away, you rush up and okay. grab the beat, okay? One, two, ready, go. Go. Oh. <laughs> 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 That's the one, but it was only one beat that was secret. There were still one, two, three. Oh, so I was only supposed to take off one. Yeah, okay, sorry if okay. I didn't make that clear. That's okay. So, so we'll, we'll give that point to the bass <laughs> side. So, <laughs> you see how that's kind of, that, I just like grabbed the beat that, that was wrong. Rhythm <laughs> dictation, just a little bit more fun that's when fun. you do that. Thank you. Okay. Um, you can just leave that there. Um, and there's also a. On pianimation.com, they have beat boards that are just hearts that you can use, and it's free. So you can print those off if you want to use those in your studio. Um, one of, so I don't know if any of you guys have kids that like video games. I try to steer my kids away from video games because I don't think it's the best use of time. But my one son, who's five, kind of finds this rhythm swing app to be like a video game. Uh, he's addicted like he just wants to because in video games. There's this um, thing called flow It's like you you have this you start to lose your sense of time You just want to keep doing it and you almost forget Other things that are going on around you because it's such an enjoyable activity and There's also that like you want to master it. You want to pass the level. That's how he feels about rhythm swing um, and so He wanted to be the rhythm boss and so what you'll do is, it'll have a rhythm that comes across the screen. There's like back tracks to make it a little bit more fun. And then you have to uh, tap the rhythm. One, two, ready, go. And you can do it anywhere on the screen or you can track. And I'm gonna do this wrong on purpose so you can just see. So when you um, let go, then, like I didn't hold that yeah, note right. out, then it automatically gives me feedback to know this is that you didn't do that right. Um, and the goal is you don't want your monkey to, he has three lives and you want him to live. And so you have three chances to get it right. And there's like five sets of rhythms and it, and it has, you know, quarter notes and then it, ha it has a section on rest and then it has a section on eighth notes. But he counts out loud. He's just five because he played this and he wants to get those rhythms right. He's rejoicing this week because he passed his rhythm. Called rhythm swing? It's called rhythm swing. And where do you find that? So it's an, at the app store, and it's on. Uh, you can. You, I think you have to get it on. A, it, I don't know if it is available on iPhone or if it has to be on iPad. I would think it would probably need to be on an iPad because it's bigger to be able to fit it. But that's a really rhythm swing is on fun. the iPhone. Is it? Okay. But not on the Android devices. Okay. Thanks, David. Um, so that's a fun way. I have my students come for a lab. So they come for their private lesson, and then they have a 30-minute lab after, and they do to do things like piano maestro and rhythm swing and the auto harp and um, just do different activities that are reinforcing what they're doing with me at lessons. It's um, and it tracks them. How much was it? Three ninety nine. Three ninety nine. See, I, to me, I'm like that is worth it because they love doing it. Um, all right, let's see. Let's move on to theory. And for theory, I just recently found this. My my son went to the neighbor's house and he loved playing Spot It, the normal version. I found there's a musical version. It's called Middle C I C, and it's on Teachers Pay Teachers. It's three dollars. We have that as a giveaway um, today, so one of you will be lucky to take it home. But what it is, it just has a bunch of symbols um, on the card and on each card. Theoretically, on every card, there should be one on the next card that is the same. I did notice that there are some that aren't, but usually if you're playing with two players, there's at least one that is the same. And so what you are supposed to do is try to find which symbol um, is the same as on your card. And so just by doing that, even if they don't know every single symbol, if I do it with them, I name the symbol, like if they're like, it's that thing with the dot and the curve for Mata. You know, I'm teaching them the names of the symbols. Um, 
as they play the game, and it's a great, it's a fun one to do for group lessons. What's that called on their website? It's called Middle C I C. Thank you. Um, I also, I have a normal big set, but I had a lot of stuff to bring of Jenga blocks where I wrote theory terms and rhythms on in different colors, so each side is a different level. And you can do this in a group lesson or a private lesson where they pull, I don't know if you guys have ever played Jenga, it's just, you get a big stack of blocks in a tower and then you have to pull them out without making the tower fall over. As they pull out the Jenga block, then they um, identify or clap the rhythm, they identify the term or clap the rhythm that's on the block. If they don't do it, then they have to pull out another one, which some of them like, but in the end, they're learning their rhythms and their theory terms just by playing a fun game. Um, I also just like to make things visual in my studio for them to learn the terms. And so I, I have a bulletin board that I post and I change the pictures and I would love more. So if you guys have ideas of things that you've found, I would love to hear them. Um, I just made this, I was thinking about, I don't, I, I just came up with this probably at night when I couldn't go to sleep. <laughs> an eighth note kind of is like an eighth rest that's lying down and has a longer flag on the end. So this is eighth note, lies, I put lays down, someone corrected me online and says lies down, which is what I had originally, but anyway, if you don't, so the English might be wrong, but eighth note lies down and stretches out for a rest. So the eighth note lays down, stretches out and then it looks like an eighth rest. And that's just a little quick mnemonic to help them remember what eighth rest is called. Um, I have, so some of you might have, this is, this may sound familiar to some of you. I wrote a, it's on my, this is also on my blog. There's a, a story of four scale sisters. Um, Cause I heard, recently heard the story of three sisters. And the first sister is sad, and the next sister is mad, and the next sister is bad, and then the last sister is glad. So I tell this story, oh, so I'll take this off, um, to introduce the different types of scales. Um, so first we have this sad sister, and she's sad because she obeys the key signature crowd, and sometimes when you follow the crowd, that doesn't make you happy. <laughs> the mad harmonic minor sister who sometimes when she goes to the top of the stairs, when she gets to the seventh step, she'll shout out a sharp word to someone in her family. Um, and then we have the bad melodic minor sister. And the reason she's bad is because she's kind of two-faced. When she's around her parents or some adults, she acts like she's happy and good. But then, when they're not looking, she is sad and bad again. <laughs> so she changes her tune. Um, and then, the sister that's just three half steps higher than the rest is the, the glad and happy sister, the major skill. So, that's just a I don't know, a fun way to introduce scales in a story-like form where they can remember the rules of the major and minor uh, scales. And then I, so when I introduced that to my student a few weeks ago, then I, after introducing it, then I had them close their eyes and listen to try and hear which scale I was playing um, before they actually are having to play them themselves. Uh, there's, I had one student that was, he looked at the page and it had a bunch of ties and slurs, and he was like, this is so confusing. Um, because there were so many in the particular piece. And so I came up with a little game to help him remember which, what the difference between ties and slurs, like what they, how can you identify them, which sometimes on theory tests you need to do. I don't know, if, I guess for here they don't do that as part of the festival, but the festival that I used to do, there was theory tests where you had to know things like that. So. Um, I think of a tie is like someone running on a track. It connects two notes that are in the same space, just like a runner that's running in the same lane. And then a slur connects, it can be two of the same notes, but there's a slope of notes in between. Um, 
And so I had him play a little game in his music, the one that he was having a hard time remember, like knowing what's, what, why, are, why are all these lines here? Where uh, we rolled a die, and if he got an even number, then he was attacked. He moved to the next tie, and he got an odd number. He, was a sl he went and moved to the slur, and we just took turns. And so by the end of doing that quick little activity, he knows the difference between ties and slurs. Um, no, there's, I liked on a, maybe you'll start, the one about Allegro's Quick. Allegro's Quick. This is from uh, Nicola Cantan on Colorful Keys. It's a free printer, a, a free poster that you can print out to help your students remember that Allegro's Quick, because Allegro's <laughs> Quick. I thought that was just a cute little thing to remember. Um, some of my older students love this site, Quizlet.com, and my daughter uses it all the time for high school. It's basically an online flashcard site where you can enter in terms. I think if you pay, it's free, but if you pay, you could also enter in images. Um, and so just like instead of writing your um, things on three by five flashcards like in the old days, it has, uh, it has the cards and you can flip them to study them and then there's some games where it has all the cards laid out and you have to match them up with your mouse or on the iPad with your finger to match the ones that go together and it times you and it will be like, oh, you're so close. It will tell like what you are compared to the person, the top person for that flashcard set or it will be like, oh, you did, you, you're, you're, you got two seconds higher. And so it gives them that instant feedback again of how fast they are remembering things, and so I have several sets on there. It's just Heidi's piano, and I use the, the music um, terms from Hal Leonard, Piano Theory, because that's what I was using 10 years ago when I put it on there. But you can search almost anything and find the set that you like, or you can add your own if you don't like the ones that are on there. So that's a great, fun resource to reinforce um, theory terms. Uh, I also just created, and I'm, I'm sad when I moved my jump drive everything was gone. So I lost a lot of my piano files when I moved, so I don't have the thing to print this out, but I created a cranium game where you have students sculpt symbols, draw symbols. Um, there's a data head that's uh, like, which famous composer never played the piano? And the choices are Chopin, Beethoven, Mozart, and Bach. Does anyone know? Bach, because there was no piano invented when he was born. Um, they, or they can draw a rhythm flashcard where they have to clap the rhythm correctly to earn a point for their team. Uh, do a super reader where they have to run to the piano and play a song that they sight read. Um, and it's usually just a simple, you know, like Twinkle Twinkle Little Star, Happy Birthday songs that people are familiar with and the team has to guess what they played. Um, note fast find where they run to the piano and find the note or the interval or the chord that's on a flashcard. And so what's nice about this is you can adapt it by having sets of cards that match your, like maybe beginning level students and intermediate, so they can play it at the same time. Um, and you can give them the ones that they are appropriate for their level. Um, and then instrument cameo, where you act out different instruments and people have to guess. So it's, it's kind of like the game of Cranium could do, but adapted for music purposes. Are these on your blog spot? Yes. So, and on my blog spot, obviously you can see I like to play games. So I have a, at the top, if you go online to a, like on a PC, there's a tab at the top that's called Piano Game Resource List. And it has a list of all of the games that I have found and used, um, organized by concept and level. So there's note reading and rhythm, and, it, and then I put on the side the level, like, I. One to five. I mean, it's not. I used the Hal Leonard books as my leveling system. That's what I used to label my books with. Um, but you can just kind of look at, browse some of the things and see what concepts you're wanting to teach your student and then find a game. And most of them are free files that I found online or something that I just came up with. Yeah, David. That premium idea that you mentioned, yeah. is that linked on there or is that just something you mentioned just now? Because that. It was your sculpting symbols or you're drawing them it asked for tasks. You said you created that, right? Yes. So if you go like if you go to my site and you go on the search and just say piano cranium, uh -huh. 
it will, uh, or maybe Music Cranium, it'll bring up the post that explains all the things that I just kind of, like examples okay. of what I do. But you can't actually print off the oh, cards no. that I use because it's, yeah, I lost files and I didn't oh. have them posted. Okay. But yeah, that's, well, you can okay. see how to do it yourself. Yeah, that's um, All right, we, let's move on to theory and then we'll have a break so you guys can have a little bit of uh, refreshments. So for theory, I love to have my students, I, I hand over the pencil a lot and I love these erasable colored pencils because they don't always do it right the first time, where I have them identify things in their music, um, whether it's, you know, find a chord or find an arpeggio and something. I, I did one activity where I just wrote four different things that I knew was in the song that I was want, trying to introduce to my student. One of them is the rub, belly, tap, head, because there was like, he needs to hold the left hand out while he moves the right hand. And I thought, sometimes it's hard for students, they want to lift that left hand and to have that independence. Um, so I had that on one stick. I had one that was uh, rainbows, where, or tar I did target too because it was a boy. <laughs> Target team for the boy, rainbows for the girls, where they had to move to a different hand position um, and to have that flow instead of just a straight across um, motion. And so I just picked out elements. One of them was uh, arpeggios. I can't remember the thing that I used to identify that, but I just chose, chose a clever name and then I had to pick a stick and then like we worked on that section first. So it was just like a way to plan out, here's how we're gonna approach your song. Here's a stick, here's a clever name that helps you remember what I'm wanting you to do in this part of the song. Um, and then I have them, you know, circle if it's, if it's the chords you're identifying or we're trying to find all the intervals of a fourth if that's a new concept. So they color code things. And I also use pencils for like dynamics. I like them to shade like piano is yellow, mezzo piano is orange and then a dark orange and then red for forte to kind of illustrate and make those pop out from the page so that they remember to play those little details in the music to make it more expressive. Um, I would say the favorite activity in my group lessons is Candyland. I just got a piano Candyland board from like the thrift store and you write the letters of the music alphabet over and over and on the peak squares, those are the special squares, um, there's some symbols. There's piano, mezzo forte, double bar line, and you can find this on Layton Music. It's a blog. You can print off the cards, and they have cards that are both for uh, piano, where, you know, if you, in the normal Candyland, you have two color dots. So this, you have like two note name dots. So you move to the, look at it, papers, FF. So you move up two Fs for that. And then they also have ones on the stack that you can use. And then, you know, sometimes when you're at the end and then you get that clumpy and you have to go back to the beginning or the piano, which is on my board, they are sad, but they get a candy if they land on a pink square. So that can make them feel happier. So, so is that on, where do we find that? Um, and that's on latentmusic.com. L-A-Y-T-O-N. Um, and then there's, I just discovered these, but I'm excited. I, they were only $2 and there's a giveaway. So Jen Boster on the Playful Piano has some practice cards I'll talk to you about in a minute, but she also has some playing cards where uh, like, a, like normal play face cards, there's groups of four that you're trying to match up. So you can play spoon. Has anyone ever played spoons before? Mm -hmm. It's like you're passing cards around and you're trying to get a set of four. So it could be, there's, she'll have like the letter A, a treble A, a bass A, and an A that's on the piano. And you're trying to get, collect all of those or four dynamic marks. So they're grouped by um, association. Um, so you could play spoons with that. You could play go fish. You can do uh, a thing called bang, where you put all the nodes in a box, and they have to pull them out and identify them. And if they get, and then you add a card that, or you can pick which one. If, if you want to say the B is the bang, if you pick the bang, then you have to put all your cards back. So you, I do this in a group setting usually, but you probably could do it just in a private lesson as well. Um, and so it's just giving them that practice of note naming or rhythm or interval or whatever the concept is that you want to enforce or reinforce, then they're just identifying them in a fun way in a game and then you see whoever has the most cards at the end of a certain, like two minutes or three minutes or whatever you choose. Um, 
my little boy loves playing slap note with the music. I was trying to teach him the alphabet on the piano keys, and so I have a little French bowl that has those that are ice cream cones. And so we just picked a letter, like it's B, and then you just throw the cards down, and then it's just a race to see who can, uh, him and his sister, who can slap the B first, and then if you slap it, then you get all the cards in, in the pile. So that's a fun way that you can use this one tool in a lot of different ways in your studios. Um, Susan Prattis has, this is a thing called Noti Noteheads. Before they're quite on the staff, I introduce my students to the patterns of the notes. Um, so she has different, three different levels of cards. There's ones that are just steps. And so it's like you can start anywhere on the piano. It doesn't matter which one because there's no clef. And then they're just looking to see if it goes down or if it goes up and they play that pattern. And so to make it a little bit more fun, I have, I add stickers on some of the cards and we play trick or treat. So they, I hold the cards on my hand, they pick one. If they pick one without a sticker, it's a trick and you have to do it. If they pick one that has a sticker, they still do it, but then they get a little treat, whether it's a goldfish or a, an M&M or just something. Um, and so. I really like these because it enforces, it reinforces intervalic reading instead of just, like I think you need a combination of both intervals and knowing the note names on the staff. Um, and so that really starts them out from the very beginning, being able to see those patterns. And that one is susanparatus.com. She has so many, like you could spend all day on her site with all the free resources. That I don't even know if that's how you say it, but it's P-A-R-A-D-I-S. And that's Noti Note Heads. So I'm always on the lookout for more piano games. My kids were like, Mom, you're always like, oh, is this another piano game? I found this last week at the dollar, at the DI. It's called Sorry Sliders. And it, you, uh, you can put four things on, or you can just have a one big long track, and you slide your game piece, and then you try to get it near the center of the bullseye. I'll kind of show that. So I just thought, well, I could use this for music. I can put a staff on there, I'm going to have to figure out a better way to attach it, but you could, you know, say, we're trying to aim for a C, and then you see how close you are to the C, and if you are a second away, then you get this many points, and so you could do it the opposite, where it's like you're getting penalized for being farther away from your target, and then the other players come in, and they can hit your guy too, so it's like you could just practice note reading with like, oh, where did it land? Oh, it landed on an F, um, just in a fun way, so kind of fun to take, if you just think of how can I adapt normal games and turn them into musical purposes. I think this is going to be, I haven't used it yet in my, with my uh, students, but my kids loved the game, so I think that one will be a lot of fun. Um, let's see if I covered all of that. Another favorite game is, you know, is Don't Eat Pete. Don't Eat Pete is just, you, you can get nine flashcards if you want. I like these uh, on Susan Paratus. Again, they also have, um, she has key signatures, she has notes, she has piano keys, so, um, and they're just arranged in a grid, and so you can cover the card with nine, whatever, goldfish, skittles, M&Ms, and then you pick one that's, I put, I had one for Halloween, I said, don't eat the poison pumpkin, so we're like, okay, that one's the poison pumpkin. And so it's an E, and in my mind I just think E, or I write it down, and then the student has to identify the notes and pull them off, and then when they go for the one that's the poison pumpkin, you shout out, don't eat the poison pumpkin. Um, that's a fun one to do as a group, but they like it individually as well. Um, and here's another Susan Paratus game that, it's called Scarecrow Stomp, but it's just like a, a game board, and then you're picking flashcards to identify as you move along the track. And she has a lot of seasonal activities that are really fun to, I don't know, that just that novelty kids like when you change things up a little bit. So there's Halloween and Thanksgiving and Christmas and St. Patrick's Day. And so even though I may be having kind of a similar game, it's just, it's a different, it's a new game. What's this new game? It's engaging. I usually try to start out every lesson with a game or activity. It's kind of like the attention getter that grabs them in to either reinforce something that they need more practice on or to introduce something new. Um, let's take a little break and you guys can have some refreshments and then it's been an hour unless you want me to just keep going. What would you? I'm fine with me. That doesn't matter to me. <laughs> like David's in charge.
let's just take like a five minute break. You can grab some refreshments and then I will. Okay, so I'm going to um, share a game that I do for in group lessons for rhythms. It's called, I call it rhythm telephone relay. You know how you play the, or the game telephone and you whisper something. For this one, you tap a rhythm. So I give a car, I actually have my students sit in two lines and I just get at the back. I tap a rhythm on their back and then they have to pass it up the line and the person at the front of the line has to grab the card that matches the rhythm that they felt. Now, they have to do it quietly or else the person at the back, if they do it loudly, then the ones in the front can hear it right away and know which one it is. Um, but I wanted to do that as our uh, as part of our game. So I need, let's see, I'm like trying to, there's no rows that have this, I need like a row that has about the same number of people. Let's see, our back row, we have four and four. And if I don't do just, oh, yeah. So let's have, I'm going to hand a rhythm to the band person in the row. And you're going to, I normally would tap, but I can't, you know, tap both sides of the room at once. So I'm going to hand this one to Justine. She's going to look at it. She's going to, when I say go, she's going to tap her neighbor, and then you guys are going to tap it down the line. And if you, if you need to not cheat, you can close your eyes. But the person at the end is then going to run up and grab the card that matches the rhythm that you heard. So one, two, three, four, five. So there's, there's only five on that one. So you can Oh, okay, that's a good one. So don't let them see. Okay. okay. So, you're gonna, so I'll, I'll come up here and we'll just say ready, go, and then you're going to tap the edge. Yes. Oh, I'm the end. No, you're the end. You're the end. You're the Five already. Five already. No, they're not. You're the end. Okay. You're the end. Okay. You're the end. Okay. You're the end. Okay. That's great. Yeah. Tap the same rhythm forward, and then when you get through the end, you got to go grab the card, right? All right. You guys ready? Ready, set, go. The same. That's correct. Yeah. For both sides. I picked okay. don't clap this one back <laughs> and then a whole note, which is another game that I use in my studio. If you have a series of rhythms, um, you can have you can have a bunch of rhythms. And this these rhythms I got from uh, Susan Paradis. She has it as trick or treat rhythms. No, actually that's not right. It's from Late Music, I believe. It's a free printable. Has lots of different rhythm patterns um, that are two measures long. And so another game that you can do with a group is don't clap this one back. You clap out a rhythm and they echo it. So, and then when you do don't clap this one back, you're supposed to listen for that one and they're not supposed to clap that specific rhythm. So it's just a fun way to practice rhythms and then you have to really pay attention if you hear that wrong. Don't clap this one back rhythm. Um, now, David said that someone had asked what I do for sight reading. Um, I mean, I think starting out from the beginning with these note note heads that helps them to see the intervals, the the games on the iPad like Note Rush and I have to look at what the name of the other one. Yeah, I'll check on that. Yeah. On the noting notes, does uh -huh. it have more than intervals of a step and a third, a, a second and a third? Does it have? It does. The, for these ones, it just has, it has and steps and skips. Okay. Um, and I think if you're with your starting with young beginners, that's that's not even on the staff. It's kind of hard for them to figure out the fourths and fifths when they're not as familiar with it. So just steps and skips on that. And then I have uh, this is my note reading binder. So I have just there was a site called The Perfect Start for Piano that just starts out with really basic notes. It has like all C's and D's on a page, and then. It'll add C's, D's, and E's. And so um, I have them say and play the name of the note um, as they go through. And I, there's no rhythm, it's just quarter notes. So they're just seeing how fast they can finish a page of note names, and then you're gradually introducing new notes. So they really get good at C, D, then you move on to C, D, E, and then it adds B, and I don't know the exact order of it. Um, so 
that's at the perfect start for piano.com. And then there's also, as once they learn all of the ones from like bass F up to treble G, um, Susan Paradis had these notes in the fast lane and they're not there anymore, which taught me a lesson. When you see a resource, you need to jump on it. Cause some of the sites that I've loved, they like either start selling them so they're not free anymore or they just have taken it off and so you can't get it anymore. So, um, and this gradually, just introduces more notes and so they have to, you know, just, I set the, I had a minute to win it timer, so I would set that and then they're just like C, C, D, they don't have to use right fingering, so it's really just focusing on the note naming. Um, but there's also a couple other resources. Diane Hitty has some for sight reading and so it starts out with like intervals of a fifth, just has C's and G's and C's and F's. So those, uh, target's not the word, what's the name of, Landmark. Landmark, yeah, that's what I was thinking of. Landmark notes, and then really basic rhythms with quarter notes and half notes. And so what I'll do is I'll put this on the page, and I, I challenge my students to see how many measures in a row can you get correct without making a mistake. I play it with them at the same time, so it lets them know when they made a mistake. But I let them choose the tempo, which is important. That I'm like, you can choose as slow as you want. My one daughter will be like, C, and then G, anyways, I'm not seeing it right. <laughs> but she does it so slow because she doesn't want to mess up. So she can get up to, you know, 30 or 40 measures in a row without making a mistake. Um, but it reinforces that idea that when you're sight reading, you do want to start slow um, so that you don't make, you want to go sl the, the, the slow pace so that you don't make mistakes. And then um, these from DianeHitty.com. Diane she now, I got these for free, but now they're for sale. How are you spelling it? Uh, Diane, D-I-A-N-E-H-I-D-Y.com. So it's sight reading sets that just gradually get harder in, you know, having expanding intervals and it starts adding a few accidentals. But they're very, very gradual. So I say, you know, I keep a little sticky, where did I have, I have a little post-it flags that are clear. I keep track of where my students are by just sticking one on that page and I write how many measures they got in a row and then they try to beat their own score um, at lessons to see if they can get even more. But if they don't, if they try to do it too fast, then they, should be, they still have to keep moving in the book. They can't go back because it has to be something new that they've never seen before. So that really gets them to want to do it slow and right at the beginning. Um, and then after that, I have, um, it used to be called jenspianostudio.com, but it's a, let's see, pianimation.com. And she has some sight reading sets that are free printables that kind of advance a little bit faster pace than the ones from Diane Hitty. But I do the same thing where they see how many they can play in a row without making a mistake. So that's a, a great way to reinforce <coughs> great sight reading. Um, and it's like a, a game because they're trying, and I like that if they're trying to beat themselves. They're not trying to beat anyone else. They're trying to see how much better can you get than last time. Um, so, does anyone have any other questions? We, could, we can move on to practice. Okay, we'll go to practice. So I first want to share with you, I, I bought this book. Um, I, I was telling someone, I sometimes read blogs more than I actually teach piano in certain weeks because I love learning. Um, and I keep, my student, I keep my studio pretty small because I have six kids and I want to focus on them right now in this phase of my life. But someone recommended this book called The Practice Revolution by Philip Johnston. And it is, it, it, it gives you a lot of ideas of how to gamify practice. And why, would we, why do we want to gamify practice? Um, there's a quote that says, gamification can improve motivation and engagement. It gives immediate feedback, badges and rewards drive students to keep coming back. That's more, I guess, talking about with the rhythm swing where you get this, you move up a level. Um, but the other thing that I found recently, there's a, there's a Teach Piano Today podcast. So I listened to it while I was cutting beans. Um, it's by Christine Carter. And she talks about how we should structure practice time and why it's more effective to how to change things up instead of just like, oh, play this 10 times. She gave that, they did this study with um, baseball pitchers, or no, baseball batters, and they had them like practice doing different types of, I don't, even, I don't know that much about baseball, but different types of swings where there's a slow pitch and there's a fast pitch. 
and they're trying to hit these different balls. So they would do like a whole bunch of one type in a row and a whole bunch of another type in a row and then a whole bunch of another type. And then they compared that to the how how well they did versus doing, you know, just like three, 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 where you're mixing it up more often. And it feels harder when you keep switching activities, but you actually learn and retain more um, when you're switching activities because our brains are hardwired to want novelty. And so after doing it a few times, then you start to kind of almost go into autoplay, I'm not even thinking about it mode. Um, and so uh, Philip Johnson has several games that he recommends for how you have your kids practice. So I'll be giving a free, uh, a practice pack um, as one of the giveaways. But yeah, I got these, uh, they don't have these at the dollar store right now, but last Christmas they had Zootopia face cards, which my kids really like more than just a normal face card. Um, and they'll, like you can pick a card and then you play that measure, or you can divide your piece up into sections and you play that <coughs> section. But um, it has, there's just like, the way that you approach practice when you do it like a, almost like it's a game. Um, one of my favorite ways that I actually do this, I love chocolate, so in college I would put chocolate chips on the left side of the piano, and then as I practiced, if I got it right, I get to move it over, or you could use pennies, you move it over, you move it over. If you do it wrong, you have to move it back, so which means you're going to have to do it more than the three times. You might have to do it like ten times if you are not really doing it slow enough, not really getting it down. So just adding those little, like suggesting little games that you teach them how to do at lessons and then have them go home and apply that um, can make their practice time more effective. So one of the giveaways that we have from the Playful Piano is we were thinking on the same page, I guess, because I was making up practice cards, but I haven't finished them yet. Um, that have pictures of different what, strategies that I want my students to use, whether it's lone lefty, where you just play with your left hand or the three in a row, um, or backtrack, where you go backwards, or nibble a note, where you just do one note and then two notes. For like a fast passage that your fingers are moving around a lot, you just do add one note at a time um, until you get the whole thing down instead of just trying to tackle it all at once. You can use a post-it note and cover up the notes and then move it as you go along. If you have a student that can't control themselves <laughs> to want to move on to the next note. Um, so I was putting some together and they have the instructions on the card. Um, she has somewhere, there's an uh, instruction page, page that you can send home in their binders that describes in detail what all of the different suggestions are. Um, and I was thinking, you know, you could pull out, I think she made them so that they fit in like baseball card sleeves, so you could have the cards that they have in their binder and then for that week, whatever ones you want them to use that specifically apply to that piece, you pull out those practice strategy cards and like, as they do them, they put them back in the sleeves. So, so they're actually, it's like they're having this physical way of keeping track of how they're actually practicing. Because I don't know about you, but I know some of my students don't really read what I write down in their notebook very well. Um, but this is, gives them a physical reminder. Um, or you could say, we're gonna learn about this one and then you can earn the card if you can teach me back how do you use this practice strategy so they can collect practice strategy cards. Um, and that's at theplayfulpiano.com. It's called Practice Trick Cards. And she also has um, piano, she has a, a, like a bingo version that has all of the tricks on a card. So you could do that in like a group setting or even individually where they're covering the things and you're talking about different ways that are effective for practice. Now, I added something that I just read on one of the, I think it was Piano Teacher Fun Makers Facebook page that I loved, was that they, they just got a simple little diagram of a keyboard and they had a paper clip with a cute little something glued to the end of it. And they wrote down, they laminated it or covered it with contact paper and then they got like a dry erase marker or a, I think they actually used the visa, visa, the wet erase markers, and they wrote down the five steps they wanted their student to use on that particular song. So they could say, count and clap, left hand alone, slow, right hand slow, hands together slow. Anyway, five steps that you add, and they move their paper clip as they do it with the goal of getting their paper clip to the end of the practice text. And I like that because it's just right there 
in their music, you can adapt it to what it is you want them to use for that specific song to match the thing that they maybe need to, to focus on, because not all songs are best played, hence separate. Um, but I just thought that was a fun, easy idea of how to get your kids to actually follow the practice instructions that you sent home. Um, let's see if I, oh, in the practice pack, there's a, there's a website called Colorful Peace by Nic Nicola Canton, she's in Ireland. And she has some free printables that you can get to put together a practice kit. Um, there's like a game board, and that works with some of the practice revolution uh, games, but she also has some descriptions of how you play the games where they keep track of, like I had my son do, he loves football, so I, you know, there's Peyton Manning, and then there's like the guy on the opposite team, and you're Peyton Manning, and here's the, other, the opponent, and then you play it, and you, if you do it right, then Peyton made a score, and then if you don't, then the other team made a score, and so they're just tracking if they do things, um, if they're practicing correctly, and it gives them more focus on the, what they're doing instead of just mundanely like playing from start to finish with slaughter notes all over the place. Um, and, then, and she has these printable mood cards. They're free if you just type in your name and your email and she'll send them to you. That are kind of fun for, even if you have a student that they, they just need to play the song a little bit more to, to work on a couple of things, you can say, okay, let's pick a card. And there's confident and silly and happy and angry and nervous. And I don't know, it's just kind of a fun way to have them repeat something, but it's in a different way so they don't feel as bored by it. What was her name again? Uh, that was Colorful Keys, Nicola, I don't know how you pronounce her name, Nicola Cantan, C-A-N-T-A-N. -A -N. She has some great, um, I don't know, if you, they're not podcasts, they're video casts where you can join in from your own home to come to a seminar just like this, but just, she'll like send out an email and say this is when it is and you can watch it and they're free. So that's a great resource to learn more. Um, this is just a fun, this is on pianimation.com, the really, really long music race. You could use it for whatever, I mean, you can make, have, there's lots of, on my piano game resource list, you'll see all different kinds of cards, interval cards, key signature cards, note name cards, where you just play the game and they move along as they grab the card and identify what it is. But it's just kind of fun with that being in color. Um, let's go to improv. So, for improv, for Halloween, I use, this one is no longer available. It's one of those windy piano, piano escapades. She doesn't have her blog there anymore. But you could come up with your own thing that's really a similar concept. There's a note names that they identify. They, so you roll it, you take turns rolling a die. They move to the circle of the note name. And then she has a C minor scale here. And so the student practices improvising and making melodies, which is sometimes so hard for students to, I don't know, I, I honestly I find that it is hard for me. I didn't have teachers that, I had the teacher that was like, you go, you sit on the bench for the full 30 minutes and they tell you what you did wrong. But I loved piano enough that was fine for me. But um, I did do a lot of impro improvisation or composition, um, outside the box kind of stuff. So. Then they pick a rhythm card, and you can model what it is, even if they don't know the rhythm, but there's like ghosts and goblins and cats and bats, and then they have to play a melody using that rhythm, starting on the note name that they found here. So they're reinforcing note names, improv, and rhythm all in one little activity. Um, one of the giveaways that I have today is from Teach Piano. Dot uh, teach piano today and it's an improv pack they have oh, five or six different seasonal improv things where they'll give you a teacher duet part that you can play along and then they have rhythms that kind of go with so this one is rock your way to school and there's shiny red apple swinging on the playground buzz goes to school bell leaky lunch box so I introduced this to my students at the group lesson using the rhythm cups. We all sat in a circle and I would have them echo the rhythms. Um, and then at their private lessons, then I had them come up with improvs by picking one or two rhythms and 
playing it now, on the Teach Piano Today website. They'll tell you what key, like whether it's a C minor or C major or all the black keys that you're supposed to have them use to just have that freedom of movement on the keys where they get to pick the notes. Um, they have the rhythm that so there's not just it's not just random anything and they do it's constrained to something that's going to sound pleasing on the piano instead of just you know play me a song on any of the keys because that can turn out to be not very pretty sometimes um so that's teach piano today improvs and i had a, when i played this one with one of my students he got to the end and he was like you know what i wish I just wish this was a repeat sign so I could do it again. <laughs> I just thought, you know, that's flow. That's like, they're so engaged and loving the thing, they just want to do it over and over, and the lesson time just whizzes by, and they're learning at the same time. So I thought that was fun. Um, they also have on Teach Piano today um, some, something that's a little bit more uh, structured, where it has you start with a motive, like Beethoven's da 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 da. And then they said, okay, let's use, I like milk and cookies. Then they give you a rhythm and then you choose the combination of notes. And then um, instead of it being like a duet with a teacher, they are making up melodies to fill in on the staff, but it also has parts of the song already written in. So it will kind of sound good that, you know, they're gonna end on the tonic note or, so even if the part that they write in is, it doesn't sound just awesome there's some extra elements that, or repetition in there to make it sound like a real song so i like that for students who are really not as ready to jump in on on improv and they don't feel like it's as natural for them um has anyone used pattern play before i love these are kind of pricey but i think they're worth it they're uh it there's different uh they'll they'll give you a there's there's duets and there's a where you can they just play it alone but they'll give you like a pattern so like the one just starts out has a pattern on the black keys that the student that the teacher plays that's just like da, 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 da. and so you have your pattern and then you can add a vacation in there you can repeat it as many times as you want then you add a vacation so it's just like the harmonies in the background that provides a framework for the student to then improvise on top of so even like a student that's there on their second lesson, you can have them develop their sense of beat by like, just play black keys for me as I'm playing this. And you can play any black keys and it sounds better if you play black keys that are close together instead of jumping all over the place. So I kind of step by step have them experiment with that improv where it's, you know, first just do quarter notes and then now let's try the bug bug slug rhythm. And then now let's see if you can do it with maybe two notes at once in different times. Um, so they can get familiar and comfortable with making up songs on the piano. And some of them are, like there's an Ireland, Ireland one that's got the 6-8 time that's just a little more <coughs> fun and fast. There's some of the minor ones and then there's reflecting that has like a open fist feeling in the background. So I, I, I really like using that for improvisation with my students. Um, we are getting close to the end, so let's move on to, I just had some extra, oh, ear training. So for ear training, I, I have MusiScore, it's a free downloadable thing where you can type the letter names on your um, keyboard to make the notes, or you can use something to drag and click. It's like a composition. Music score. MusiScore, it's M-U-S-E-S-C-O-R-E. -E. So, I don't have my students use it because it's a little too complex for most of them to just drag and click and add symbols and stuff. But when I want to create my own um, drills or technique or whatever, I use it. So I use that to create the, this piano pattern bingo. And I have different cards that are different colors and I just move them around by cutting and pasting them. And so I have, I, I like to um, introduce technique by having something that you, they sing in association with it so they can remember the name as they're doing it. So this is scaling up the trees and then
thinking of the name of what it is as you play it. And I have the names written on here, so I'll play a group lesson game where I play one and they have to find the pattern on their, it's like bingo, they have to find the pattern that's on their, their game card and, and uh, add a little token or whatever and try to get bingo or three in a row for that. Um, and then uh, this is on Pianimation.com where you can play examples of staccato, low, high, minor, soft. You can play a passage that's like that or if you just want to play like a scale or a few notes, you can start out with that and do a similar thing where they're trying to identify what they heard. I like to, I love group lessons because it, it makes piano so much more fun when they have these friends they come together with. It's like a party. Like I had a Halloween party yesterday and they got to come in their costumes and play their songs and we play games. Um, and I lost my, let me think I was going to, oh, I know what I was going to say. When they perform, I don't just say, okay, let's perform. Let, you just go up in the order. I'll pass out note cards that have letter names on them or okay today we're going to go in the order of the skipping music alphabet so who has an a who has a c who has an e and so they perform in the order of whatever i want you know key signatures music alphabet whatever card i want to use for that day so that just is an opportunity for them to review a concept um, and then i have the students who are listening have something that they're listening for whether it's like i've had them do a thing where they can rate you know how how did you hear different dynamics? Did the person do a float off at the end? Did they remember to bow? So they're listening and looking for proper performance uh, things as they listen to their peers play. So it's not just a perform. It's not just there for the performer. It's also for the listener to learn how to listen. And I, I or I'll ask questions at the end. Was that a major or a minor? Or was that? What time signature was it in? You listen as they play and then tell me if it's 3 4 or 4 4. Um, so, again, just multitasking, really getting more than one concept in at once. Uh, this is another ear training example that has musical patterns where you play the pattern and they have to find the pattern on the card. Whether And, and there, these are, this is at 4dpianoteaching.com. Um, and it just has steps and skips in different patterns, but it helps them to hear that the, the way that the melodic contour is for that being. We already talked about don't clap this one back. Um, and then I have Susan Paratus again has a lot of seasonal activities. This one is, I, I use it even not when it's turkey time, but this is a Thanksgiving one. It's called Chasing the Turkey. She has really quick games. So it usually will only take like five minutes of your lesson that you can do one-on-one -on -one, or you could do in a group setting. Um, and there's different levels of cards that you're just moving along the game board and you know you name the interval or name the note or name the, the time signature um, or name the key signature if it's a, a harder level. Uh, just to review those concepts and I, I like how it's it's not a test. It's not like you're sitting down and like Here's this test. Can you show me what you know? It's a game, and if they get it wrong, I still let them go, <laughs> because the point of the game is for them to get that review and and to learn. Um, but it just makes it more fun for them that they're not feeling this sense of defeat or failure because it's a game. It's not like a test. Um, let's do we'll do this toss it out activity, and then I'll go to the giveaways because we're getting close to time to wrap up. So. This is from um, Pianimation.com, and it reviews intervals and note names at the same time. So I need a volunteer from the treble and a volunteer from the bass to come and try this. And what we're going to do is all the say we are aiming for a G, and you're going to stand back and you're going to toss your note at the staff, and then you see how close you got to the G. And the points. The option of the game is to have the least amount of points. So you do several rounds, but we'll just do one. Um, and how you get, if, you, if you're right on, you get a point. If you're a second away, you get two points. If you're a third away. So you're measuring intervals and naming notes at the same time. So is there someone on the base class side that will come over and 
really need to volunteer for this, and then how about on our travel side? Just so you know, the base club is winning right now. Too. <laughs> <laughs> oh, really good. <laughs> travel. <laughs> no pressure. Travel. Can someone come over and help? Nobody wants to. Okay. So you're just gonna you're just gonna toss or anything like this, and we'll say we're aiming for a G. So it can be a base G or it can be a treble G. G. Yeah, and then you just toss it like that, and like, oh, that's not a G. That's a fifth away. I got five points. No. So anything more than a fifth is just five points. So all right, so we just stand about. Yeah, you can see it at the same time. Okay. What are we going for? A Ready, G. set, go for a G. Oh, I'm not even on there. Okay. Oh, you're so close. So then you just measure. Okay, this looks like it's a, a C. So that'd be a fifth away if you go to this G, or it'd be a fourth away if you go to this G, right? Oh, let's say four. Sometimes I'll say we're just doing it in a treble. <laughs> like I'll do a, a bass <laughs> round and then a treble round, so it's harder for the treble round. And then this is, we've got the F. So this one's going to be a third away because it's a D. So the treble wins on that one. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I just made. Uh, this is uh, this isn't the greatest floor staff, but it's a shower curtain and duct tape. It's if I were to, I would like to do like if you get a more durable tablecloth, you could make one. Or they sell them if you want one that's gonna last you a lifetime with like vinyl and uh, black stuff to go on it. So let's go to our giveaways now. So I have the names in here that David gave me of people who were at RSVP in advance. So our first giveaway is um, a practice tricks pack. This just has the code on it for you so you can go online and you can get a free practice tricks pack from the playfulpiano.com. Um, those are the cards that have the different ways that you can practice as bingo cards. The other thing I forgot to mention is you can buy Avery labels that have round stickers that match the 10 most used practice tricks that you can stick on your student's music. So if it's like, I want you to do slow-mo, you just stick this little snail icon in their music. Um, I haven't bought the Avery labels yet for my set yet, but that's, and then you can print them for as many, as many copies as you want for your students. So the Playful Piano Practice uh, Pack. Goes to Landon Lewis. Landon here. <laughs> oh, and then I should read off. Can you? So at the Playful Piano, um, Jen said that she would also give a 10% discount to all of the UVM team members up to October 31st for anything that you want to buy on her website that's $10 or more. Um, so do you the, want to say the code? Yeah, I do want to say the code and you guys can write that down. It's all capital and it says Rexburg, M as in mother, T as in tricks, A as in all, one zero. Yeah. Rexburg, MTA, 10. So it's like Rexburg Music Teacher Association, 10. Oh, That's probably what she was thinking of. And 10, because it's 10% 10. 10 off anything. And this is which side? And that's the playfulpiano.com. Okay, and then I have a an improv pack, and this is from now. This some a lot of these are available for free if you want to take the time and the money to print them off, get the cardstock, use the color ink. Um, this is a the prep, this is the improv pack from teachpiano.com, teachpianotoday.com that has the St. Patrick's Day duet and Rock the Way to School, McDrip the Slushy Snowman, and a Halloween. Um, one and the winner of that is Lisa Gort. That's right. Thanks. Okay, next we'll do our rhythm themed one. And so, well, I got two kinds of silly putty for the rhythm beat board. Usually I just put a sheet protector over the rhythm beat board so I can use it over and over. 
And this one is glow in the dark, but I like having two so I can, if I'm doing like quarter and half notes, it's like it visually looks different even beyond the, the, the half notes stretched farther. Um, so the rhythm pack goes to Monica Pobly, Pobly? Monica here? Oh, then we get to pick someone else. I Cuckoo Weller? How do you say your name? Okay, cool, cool. Okay. So in here there's the, um, the rhythm beat boards, the pumpkin trick-or-treat cards, and then also that game of chance that I talked about using with students that need a little bit of a thing. Okay, so, oh, I didn't give you the silly, who's the rhythm? Was that the rhythm one? Yes, you need the silly putty. That silly putty is not good on the carpet, so I really, you don't want to let your kids, if you have kids, you don't want them to play it on the carpet. You, I get a table or something that's going to protect. Um, okay, for our next table eight, I'll do the theory pack, which has the spotted cards. And I like to use, I just get contact, I cut things out and I put contact paper because I don't have a laminator. And that works great. And then it also has, oh, in the manner of the music term, I didn't mention that, but Susan Ferrandis, I don't know if you've ever played in the matter of the adverb. Uh, you have a student, there's these silly sentences, and then they have to say it in the manner of the music term. So I could say, uh, let's see, where's a good one? I didn't practice because my sister gave me a $10 to be quiet. Like, how did I say that? That's staccato. So I have to listen to how you're saying it. And guess what terms? That's a fun group game. And this goes to Crystal Nelson. Where's Crystal? No, she's not here. She's not here. She wasn't, is there, but Crystal was here, right? Crystal Oh, that's different. Okay. Uh, Vanessa Beard. She left too. Janice Allison. Oh, oh you're here. I think you were saying that you needed to do a different one. So would you rather have a different? Because she teaches strings. And so the, uh, I kind of think of the rhythm one is the one that I have that is more for all like types of music teaching. But, or this note reading. Would you rather swap for a note reading one? Okay. Um, okay, so this is the, Note reading pack, it has a game, a Wonder Keys game from teachpianotoday.com. It has some tic-tac-toe boards for note reading that you can use for Don't Eat Pete or tic-tac-toe or other ways. And then it also has, oh, I need to put this back in here. It has the toss note game. And if you don't have a staff and you don't want to invest in one, you can get masking tape and throw it down on your carpet and it still works just as well. And that goes to Tanya Campbell, and she's not here either. She's in Canada, I thought. So that's my neighbor. Um, Susan Erickson. Okay, and then we have um, a practice kit that has the mood cards and some instructions for games, a scorecard, some dice, and some playing cards, and post-it notes. And that goes to Stephen Thomas. Yeah. 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 Catherine Budikoffer. Okay, and this is another practice kit. I did realize after I got here that I don't have the instruction page in here, so I can uh, email it to you. You tell me your email. Um, and that goes to Marta Broga? Is that no, not here? Okay. Nikki Waring. 
So if you want to come up after and tell me your email, yeah. then I'll email that document to you. Um, and then our last one is just our piano te technique fun stuff. Um, and that goes to Charlotte Hill. Yeah. Yeah.